Tonight, a rail strike and a propane shortage mean looming disaster for farmers and their crops. This year has been a hard year. What's at stake and what the federal government is doing. How to deal with the rising trend in liquor store thefts and sometimes violence. I just felt shocked. My jaw dropped. Also tonight, just after a little boy receives the life-saving medical supplies he needs, video of someone stealing them. And pinpoint testimonies at the impeachment hearings. And I did say to him, Ambassador Sondland, Gordon, I think this is all going to blow up, and here we are. After the final day of public hearings, are Democrats ready to push ahead to a vote? This is The National. The strike by CN Rail Workers. It's only been going on for three days now. But for a large group of Canadians, the ripple effects are immediate. You see, one of the commodities shipped by rail is propane. And for farmers in Ontario, and especially Quebec, propane is a lifeline for their grain and their livestock. And as Sarah Levitt explains, time is already running short. Ben Hammond's combine shouldn't be sitting idle in the garage and his farm shouldn't be this quiet. Everything just comes to a standstill. The crucial work of harvesting and drying his grain has ground to a halt due to a shortage of propane, which farmers rely on. I made a phone call and found out that uh, we weren't getting any more propane. Quebec gets almost 85% of its propane supply via train. That supply was abruptly cut off when railway workers went on strike early Tuesday. 50% left fuel. So that's going to be good for a little over half a day. Hammond uses approximately 8,000 litres of propane every day. Farmers across Quebec and Ontario are feeling the shortage. We're depending on that delivery of the product by rail to the suppliers. So when it's cut off, we don't have it. And when it's cut off and we don't have it, that means it's an issue for our, our farmers to operate their businesses. In Quebec, the situation is becoming an emergency and not just for farmers. Propane is also critical in several other sectors, like nursing homes and other public institutions with vulnerable people. Right now, we use uh, about uh, 6 million litres of propane every day. We only have reserve for 12 million. We're trying to find uh, trucks. Uh, we're uh, also uh, trying to convince the federal government to accelerate negotiation with the union. Hammond says the year has already been a tough one for farmers everywhere. With Mother Nature, there's not much you can do to, be, to combat her, but uh, this, there is no need of this at this time. Hammond stands to lose close to $700,000 worth of grain, something he says would be disastrous for his farm, and his story is just one of many. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, La Chute, Quebec. Now, Quebec's opposition to pipelines is a sore spot in Alberta. So the propane situation spurred Premier Jason Kenney to tweet, Note to our friends in Quebec, we have technology that could help supply you with more reliable access to propane and other important fuels. Hashtag build those pipes. There is a pipeline bringing a mix of crude oil and natural gas liquids east. It stops in Sarnia, Ontario, and is refined into propane. Suppliers are sending tanker trucks there to help fill the gap. Now, you heard Quebec Premier François Legault's call for accelerated negotiations. Here's what Transport Minister Marc Arnault had to say about that. Our chief mediator uh, from uh, uh, Minister uh, Tassi's office is uh, working with both sides. They realize uh, how quickly, uh, how important it is that we find a solution to this. CN called for binding arbitration, but Garneau says he would prefer a negotiated settlement. Now, of course, Garneau kept his portfolio in yesterday's cabinet swearing-in ceremony. But the way some others were shuffled into new roles, Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, seemed to have Western frustrations and a few key people in mind. David Cochran now on how the PM and his team today got to work. He doesn't have any MPs in Alberta, so he's reaching out to prominent Westerners such as the mayor of Calgary. It's an important time uh, for us to have a frank conversation. A frank conversation about the oil patch and Alberta's demand for changes to environmental laws like Bill C-69. 
He did not say anything specific. I will continue to be a thorn in the side for that. Um, but he did say that he was open to improving that legislation so that it actually makes life better. I think there's an openness uh, to look at uh, the legislation. The Prime Minister has said that. To look at the legislation, but not change it. Instead, tweak regulations and the implementation of the law to ease industry concerns. Uh, the important thing is the, the spirit and the attitude we bring to the task at hand. I feel like it's, we're being a little bit hijacked by kind of Alberta's agenda. But also today, a blunt reminder from the mayor of Vancouver that much of this anger ends at the Rockies. I just get upset when people say Western alienation because British Columbia, what we want to do is work with this government. So a cooperative B.C., a suddenly calmer Ontario. Tomorrow, I'll travel to Ottawa to meet with Prime Minister Trudeau and deliver a simple message. Prime Minister, we look forward to working with you. But a still angry Alberta, where the new Natural Resources Minister is headed tonight. And then I'll be heading back next week. Uh, there's a time-honored tradition of Newfoundlanders who fly back and forth to Alberta for the oil and gas sector. It's so a Newfoundlander heading west to do a job, this one with enormous political stakes. David Cochran, CBC News. Ottawa. Okay, to Washington now, where after three days, eight witnesses and more than 20 hours of testimony, a week of high political drama in the U.S. has come to a close. Paul Hunter brings us the vivid details of today's two witnesses in the Democrat-led impeachment inquiry of Donald Trump. You swear or affirm they were the final witnesses in a momentous week on Capitol Hill. David Holmes, counselor at the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine and... Fiona Hill, former Russia advisor with the U.S. National Security Council, who today underlined... I have no interest in advancing the outcome of your inquiry in any particular direction except toward the truth. She began by urging Republican lawmakers to ignore a conspiracy theory that's become part of the inquiry, that somehow it was Ukraine, not Russia, that meddled in the 2016 U.S. election. A fictitious theory, she said, evidently pushed by Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani in the face of mountains of evidence it was, in fact, Russia. So... Is it your understanding then that President Trump disregarded the advice of his senior officials about this theory and instead listened to Rudy Giuliani's views? That appears to be the case, yes. And so on the big question, whether Trump wrongly tried to pressure Ukrainian President Zelensky to investigate Trump rival Joe Biden, or as she put it, in a domestic political errand. Hill testified that Trump's former national security advisor, John Bolton, derisively likened the pressure on Zelensky to a drug deal, and that he described Giuliani, said to have been pressing Ukraine on Trump's behalf, this way. That Rudy Giuliani was a hand grenade that was going to blow everyone up. Holmes, meanwhile, testified about overhearing a phone call in Ukraine between Gordon Sondland, the U.S. ambassador to the EU who testified yesterday, and Trump. The president's voice was loud and recognizable. Holmes first quoted Sondland as saying to Trump, that President Zelensky, quote, loves your ass. I then heard President Trump ask, so he's going to do the investigation. Ambassador Sondland replied that he's going to do it. Said Holmes he knew investigation was code for Biden. And quoted Sondland later saying that when it came to Ukraine, Trump only cared about big stuff. I noted there was big stuff going on in Ukraine, like a war with Russia. And Ambassador Sondland replied that he meant big stuff that benefits the president, like the Biden investigation that Mr. Giuliani was pushing. Okay, so Paul, now that this week's testimony has wrapped, what's next? Well, you never really know uh, answers to that kind of question around here anymore, Andrew. But these hearings are now probably over. There's Thanksgiving week next week after that. It'll probably go to the Judiciary Committee, which will probably vote to impeach Donald Trump before Christmas. Then it's to the Senate for probably a two-week trial in January, after which he'll probably be allowed to stay in office. That's a lot of probabilities, but I'll tell you this much, when it's all said and done in January, the 2020 presidential campaign will begin in earnest. The fun never stops. Paul Hunter, thanks very much. Now, as Donald Trump faces the possibility of impeachment, a world leader he has heavily supported is staring straight into the fact of indictment. That's the unique position Israel's prime minister is in tonight. But as Margaret Evans explains, like Trump, Benjamin Netanyahu is not one to back down. 
A sad day for the people of Israel. Those were the words of the Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit as he announced criminal charges against Benjamin Netanyahu. Bribery, breach of trust and fraud. It is the first time an Israeli Prime Minister has been indicted while in office, even if only in a temporary capacity. Netanyahu has tried and failed twice over the past year to form a government. But he's also Israel's longest serving Prime Minister and he came out fighting tonight. We are witnessing an attempted coup against a serving Prime Minister, he's saying, based on fabrications. The indictments have been hanging over Netanyahu for some time now. There has been so many speculations in the past that it makes you think that there has to be something there. But Netanyahu, Bibi, to most Israelis, has his supporters too. I think that Netanyahu is the strongest figure that Israel has ever had on the world stage. That's certainly the image he likes to promote, his friendship with the U.S. President Donald Trump paying dividends this week when Washington removed its objections to Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories considered illegal under international law. In an interview in September during the last election, analyst Reuven Hazan said the friendship was key for many voters. It makes the people who vote security think that we have a world-class leader who is delivering. So if he's corrupt, still, it's a worthy bargain. But many Israelis, too, are worried about the state of their democracy, and it explains the stalemate in politics right now. Netanyahu has been unable to form a government, but neither has the opposition Blue and White Party. The only certainty in Israel right now is that Netanyahu will not leave without a fight. There is no legal requirement that he stand down unless he's found guilty. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Back to this country now and a disturbing trend. Winnipeg police say they're getting 10 to 20 calls a day about thieves rushing liquor stores and stealing bottles. And increasingly, it's turning violent. Yesterday, three employees were attacked right in broad daylight. And as Cameron McIntosh tells us, the people who work in those stores are demanding help. A brutal assault, starting with the person in black, armed with a knife, hitting both a staff member and a security guard in a suburban Winnipeg liquor store. Another suspect in red walks past the security camera, bottles in hand. Then this. The attacker punches and knocks another employee out cold before assaulting two others in an adjoining mall. He punched on the right side of my cheek. Including this woman whose identity we're protecting. When he hit me, for a few seconds I just got numb and I, my brain stopped working. The alleged attacker, a 15-year-old boy, faces several charges including theft and aggravated assault. The woman attacked in the store is in hospital. She has suffered seizures. It's the most violent example in an epidemic of thefts targeting Manitoba liquor stores over several months, where staff and security don't intervene for safety, a policy being exploited in increasingly brazen fashion. Hundreds have been arrested over the last number of months. We have, um, we have some uh, people dedicated to doing almost nothing but looking at video from liquor stores. Leo Dame worked in that very store and has seen dozens of robberies. This open theft policy where uh, no touch policy has, has, has worked against us in some ways. Hundreds of people are joining in the fray. Good evening, everyone. Last night, the Manitoba Liquor Control Commission hastily announced a new locked door policy it had originally planned for next week customers will have to show ID to get in. A new secure door is now being installed in that very store with others to follow. When someone is injured as a consequence of an attack such as this. As the Premier warns. This is totally, totally unacceptable and the full force of the law will be brought to bear on people who engage in this kind of behaviour. We are going to have a major problem here and somebody will unfortunately be killed. Now a big part of the problem here is there have been so many thefts that only the most extreme cases are being fully prosecuted. That's leading to a lot of repeat crime that these stores and authorities here just can't get a handle on. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now we should add, Winnipeg isn't the only place to see these kinds of violent robberies. It's happening right across the country.
Edmonton has seen a 350% increase in thefts since last year. And a surge in robberies across Ontario has prompted the Provincial Liquor Control Board to increase security personnel. It says about $77 million in booze was stolen in 2018. And police have laid hundreds of charges since then. Okay, now you've heard about thieves snatching courier packages from doorsteps. And with the holidays coming, you'll probably hear more of those cases. But one case in particular in Saskatoon really shows how the harm done can be far more than just an inconvenience. In this story from Bonnie Allen, keep your eye out for the young victim and how much was at stake for him and his parents. Okay. Crystal Leptic's son Leo is nearly two and unpredictable, so she expects the unexpected. Smash. But never this. On Tuesday, Leptic's security camera captured so-called porch pirates snatching seven large boxes off her doorstep. I just felt shocked. Like, I, I think my jaw dropped and we just thought, okay, this could be devastating. This could have a really big impact on how we're able to care for Leo. Yep. The boxes contained bandages for Leo. He's known as a butterfly child. Yeah, touch. You gotta be gentle, right? Leo was born with a rare condition called epidermal lysis bullosa. It causes his skin to break and blister at the slightest friction. Every other day, Crystal and her husband Adam spend nearly an hour wrapping Leo head to toe in specialized bandages. Any other typical bandage would tear his skin right off. So um, this is what protects him from the world. The stolen shipment had a month's supply worth about $5,000. The Leptic shared their video with the community and police. Within hours, some Saskatoon police officers recognized the two women and arrested them. And other sizes. This afternoon, police returned the bandages to the family. It's why our officers do what they do every day. They do amazing work each and every day, day in and day out. I have to say that in our darkest moments, we always find that we've had incredible support. Crystal Leptic says the thieves ran off without ever seeing their victim. She hopes now they've seen Leo's face. Yeah. Yeah. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Wow, that story is something. Okay, uh, still ahead on tonight's National. Another teen who vaped has been diagnosed with a lung illness, but doctors are warning this one's different. And later, the forestry practice that's come under fire because it can increase the risk of fires. And from our Vancouver newsroom, we're tracking several stories, including this one. A bed shortage has forced a New Brunswick hospital to take extreme measures. We're back in two minutes. The number of vaping-related illnesses keeps going up. In the U.S., almost 2,300 people have gotten sick. 47 have died. In Canada, there are no reported deaths. But there are now 11 cases of illness linked to vaping here. And now we're learning that not every case is the same. Health officials in Ontario have identified a unique type of lung damage in a teenager. Now, he doesn't want to be identified, but he came close to death after heavy vaping. Christine Birak has more. The teen's parents brought him to this London, Ontario hospital with a bad cough. Within weeks, he couldn't breathe. Extremely critical. He was on life support and uh, we were concerned that he might not survive. The 17-year-old admitted he'd been vaping daily for five months, inhaling green apple and cotton candy flavored nicotine along with THC from cannabis. Doctors suspected he had the same vaping-related illness investigators are seeing in Canada and across the United States. But x-rays revealed a different type of damage. We also did CT scans, and that gives us a deeper look at the lungs. Picture the branches of a tree when in the springtime when a tree is budding. That's what we were seeing on these images of the CT scan. And that's a pattern that is in keeping with damage. He's been diagnosed with bronchiolitis or popcorn lung, an injury first seen 10 years ago in workers at a microwave popcorn factory. After inhaling a buttery flavored chemical called diacetyl, their small airways became so inflamed or swollen, their lungs couldn't push out carbon dioxide. To date, most vaping related injuries appear to involve vitamin E acetate. That additive coats and damages the tiny air sacs at the end of the airways. 
This respirologist is documenting the teen's case. Four months uh, post discharge from the hospital, he still has a very severe obstruction of his airways. Doctors insist Health Canada has failed to properly regulate vape products. <laughs> These addictive products slip in and rather than helping people quit, are addicting a new generation of youth to nicotine is hugely problematic and we saw this coming. <laughs> Canada's new health minister says her agency is monitoring the effects of vaping on kids and may ban certain flavors, a move doctors say is far too little too late. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. Now some provinces aren't waiting for Health Canada to take action. PEI is poised to bring in some of the toughest rules, banning certain flavors, restricting where vape products can be sold, and raising the legal age to buy e-cigarettes from 19 to 21. Now, B.C. made similar moves last week. It's also restricting advertising and raising taxes on vape products. That's going from 7% to 20%. And Ontario plans to ban vaping ads altogether in convenience stores and gas stations. Okay, let's go to our national newsroom in Vancouver, where Ian is watching stories from across Canada. And Andrew, let's begin in northern New Brunswick, where Campbellton Hospital will be shutting its doors to new patients as staff try to deal with critical levels of overcrowding. Officials say they're at full capacity, with 42 people in stretchers, some of them stuck in hallways. About half the hospital beds are taken up by patients waiting for long-term care. This is an issue that advocates say is a chronic problem in the region. They've known for quite some time that there was a crisis. It just seems that there's not a will to move forward. For the next seven days, ambulances will be diverted and new patients will be redirected to a hospital an hour away. You may remember a disturbing story from Regina this summer where people had coffee thrown at them. There had been concerns the two incidents were racially motivated. Well, today we're learning a teenager has been charged with assault. Video of one of the incidents surfaced online and quickly went viral. A group of boys approached a man in a shopping center parking lot. They allegedly asked him for the time, then doused him in coffee. A 14-year-old boy faces two counts of assault with a weapon. And Alberta's legislature passed Bill 22 today. The controversial bill clears the way for the firing of the province's elections commissioner. Lauren Gibson was investigating the UCP leadership race. That was won by Jason Kenney, who became premier. The opposition NDP says firing Gibson now is corrupt and undemocratic. But the UCP says it is strictly a cost-saving move. Today's vote took place despite a last-minute letter from the Ethics Commissioner suggesting some MLAs could be in breach of the Conflict of Interest Act if they voted on the bill. Another billionaire wants to be president of the U.S., one of the international stories we'll have for you in 20 minutes. And we do have to take a short break, but when we come back, a marketplace investigation into those blue light-blocking glasses, why the sales pitch is actually misleading consumers. And later... You're not seeing things. A 21st century environmental activist has a 19th century doppelganger. Well, between our uh, smartphones, tablets, and computers, we all spend more time in front of a screen than perhaps we would like to admit. That's where blue light blocking glasses come in. They're meant to protect your eyes, but a marketplace investigation found that claim can be misleading. Magda Gabor Selassie explains. From fashion to fit, the selection of glasses is endless. But the latest sales pitch from some of Canada's largest optical chains is about blue light filtering lenses that apparently save you from your screens. Because the blue light is really damaging. We visited lens crafters, Hakeem Optical, Hudson's Bay Optical, and Vogue Optical locations in Ontario with hidden cameras. We kept hearing about the harm that digital blue light can cause. It has a very sharp rays, it's penetrating at the back of the eyes. But they've got it wrong, says eye surgeon Dr. Sunir Garg. He's worried that consumers are being misled. I think people are thinking, well, geez, you're right. After I use my computer for a bunch of hours, my eyes don't feel very good. I can't see really well. They're kind of irritated. But what's bothering them isn't the blue light. It's the fact that when they're staring at their screen a lot, they're not blinking as often. That causes the eye to dry out. And when your eyes become dry, they become irritated and scratchy and tired. Back at the stores, the claims about blue light from your screens get more alarming. 
it caused direct moon damage. I think people are exaggerating the problem and are misleading their customers. And so I think a lot of this is just to create sort of, a, I hate to say it, fear and confusion. And when people have fear and confused, they end up spending money on things they don't need to spend money on. We even hear this at one HBC location. So it caused skin cancer, cataract, macular degeneration, and other eye conditions. Blue light does? Yeah, if it is a constant exposure. From your digital screens? Digital screen, laptop, uh, cell phone. They seem to be getting that info from an in-store pamphlet. Those are the two most scary things you can talk about. You can talk about cancer and blindness, and you're out telling me that these glasses will protect against both? Where do I sign? But that's just not where the scientific data is. We ask the companies about the claims. They all say the science is still evolving and argue that blue light can be damaging. Lens crafters and Vogue Optical say they'll reinforce their staff training. Hakeem adds that the blue light filter lenses they sell won't harm consumers. After we contact them, Hudson's Bay Optical says the claims about cancer and macular degeneration in their stores are wrong. They say they'll pull the pamphlets and retrain staff. The maker of the lenses stands by its marketing. Mark de Gebrasselasse, CBC News, Toronto. And you can watch the full Marketplace investigation tomorrow night on CBC Television at 8 p.m. local, 8.30 in Newfoundland and Labrador. Well, still ahead, Canada has some of the world's most pristine forests, but there's growing debate over an herbicide that's used to manage them. We're going to take you into the woods and in depth next. Welcome back. Canada has about 10% of the world's forests. Vast tracts of it are managed with the herbicide glyphosate. Tonight, we're going in depth into that practice because of how it shapes the very way those forests grow. Now, first, Maxime Corneau of Réseau Canada's program La Semaine Verte takes us to BC, where what seems good for forestry profits may be costing communities in fires. So we're gonna go and check out a block that they sprayed last August. He's a woodworker turned forest crusader. This is where a lot of logging is happening now. And James Tidal's ranch isn't far from here. People from all over the world come here. Excellent fishing. A block of crown land in northern British Columbia, tucked behind a popular fishing river, recently harvested for its coniferous trees. This is what I wanted to show you guys. Then sprayed with herbicides to make sure that's all that grows back. Very little is growing here. A lot of deformed vegetation. It's all brown. It's not looking so hot. It devastates him as someone who grew up in these woods and has seen them change. It's all about growing conifer trees and to hell with everything else. But it's a forestry practice happening in many parts of Canada. Deciduous broadleaf trees like aspen are treated like weeds, cut from the ground and exterminated from the sky. That helicopter is spraying an herbicide called glyphosate. And once it passes over, the aspen and birch may not grow back for a hundred years, allowing coniferous trees like pines to prosper. So in uh, 2012, this place was chock full of aspen trees and the pine trees. And uh, so the aspen was seen as a threat to these pine and they sprayed it. But um, the year after they sprayed it, it just looked like a, a moonscape in here. Um, everything was dead except for the pine trees. To people who don't really get out in the woods a lot, this looks pretty good, right? It's really green here. Uh, the trees are growing really quickly, but it's, it's one type of tree. Now we have pretty much a pine monoculture. It's an effective practice for BC's timber industry. One species of tree delivered to the same mill, processed in the same way. It's easier, cheaper. And it's the rule if you want to harvest on Crown land. To get a license, BC foresters are required to get rid of nearly all the aspen. Since 1992, nearly 3.5 million hectares across Canada, that's more than six times the size of Prince Edward Island, have been sprayed with glyphosate. 500,000 of those in BC. 
In total, it's still a fraction of BC's forest, but there's more to it than that. These trees are incredibly flammable, is one of the, the things that we need to consider here. And a crucial consideration. In 2017, forest fires ripped through British Columbia. More than half a million hectares went up in flames in just a few days. Before the end of that summer, more than 65,000 people were evacuated from their homes. Aren't you guys going? You gotta go now. Resulting in nearly $130 million in insured damages. That doesn't include government spending to actually fight the fires and study them afterwards. This UBC professor is also studying what was left behind two years ago. How many trees have you got so far? She uh, so says far the province got... needs to take a close look at how aspens impact forest fire behavior. Laurie Daniels took us here to the edge of the historic Williams Lake fire to show us. As the fire spread this way, it came to the edge of this patch of aspen forest. And you can see right on the edge where the trees, both the needle leaf trees and the aspen trees were killed. But as the fire spread closer and into the aspen stand, it stopped. It no longer spread along the surface. And so you see the char stops on the base of the trees. And if we look right into the aspen stand over here, the trees have all survived. And that, she says, is a sign that broadleaf trees, here the aspen, slow down destructive wildfires. In other words, in mandating the removal of aspen, the province is making a problem that costs millions worse. So we find in aspen forests, in birch forests, and other broadleaf forests, because of that subtle change in shade and temperature and humidity, they tend to be more resistant to fire. The practice of removing all the competing vegetation, to use glyphosate to try to remove aspen or other competing vegetation, the word competing is really critical there because their competition for conifer trees that we want to grow in order to have a sustainable timber industry. So it means that we're putting just one value, the timber value, ahead of all the other values. BC's Minister of Forests declined an interview. The department's spokesperson says glyphosate use is down. But for the millions of hectares that have already been sprayed, the damage is done. Well, it makes me mad, really. I get upset about it. We look at forests as some kind of farm, some kind of vegetable garden where you're trying to grow carrots, and if it's not a carrot, you get rid of it. And I think forests are a little more complicated than that. Here, these glyphosate-resistant pines will grow tall, but the aspen will be gone for decades, a young forest more fragile than before. Maxime Corneau, CBC News, Prince George, British Columbia. Now, Quebec is the only province that bans the use of glyphosate in forestry. The most intensive use is in New Brunswick, and that alarms one professor of forestry there. Sylvie Fournier from Réseau Canada's programme Enquête lays out what he did about it and the price he now says he paid for speaking out. Today I can announce I've retained the expertise of the best defence lawyer who has represented whistleblowers across our nation. Woo! Yesterday we filed suit for wrongful dismissal. It's turned into a movement now. Thank you very much. But it was only this summer that Maritime College of Forestry professor Rod Cumberland suddenly lost his job. Honestly, I was devastated. I mean, furious to hear that he'd been let go. And then I read the reasons why. And yeah, it just didn't make any sense to me. How you doing? His letter of dismissal from the New Brunswick College said he was undermining the content of the seminar on the science of vegetation management. We are looking for an investigation. Cumberland and his supporters say what that means is clear. Five, six, seven, eight, bring your Higgs, investigate. They believe he was fired for his stance on using the herbicide glyphosate as a forest management tool. He completely disagrees with it has research linking it to declining their populations. And he's been vocal. People need to wake up. This isn't just an issue about people in rural New Brunswick. It's not just about 
people that hunt deer. This this is about it's, it affects everybody. It's it's about our health. It's about our environment. In a province dominated by the multi-billion dollar Irving Empire, and which relies heavily on the company's forestry arm, J.D. Irving, there is a feeling by some that speaking out against current forestry practices is a risky move. Others say that under adequate regulation, strategic spraying of glyphosate is sustainable. Il y a de la biodiversité dans des plantations. Ça fait c'est faux, ça dire qu'il y en a pas. Mike Legere, director of industry group Forest NB, says they need to keep spraying with glyphosate to stay competitive. The province has gone so far as to create a website, forestinfo.ca, in partnership with industry and scientists to educate the public on the issue. In particular, has been glyphosate. Len Ritter is a top Canadian expert in toxicology. He appears on the site. And so the question becomes, is glyphosate, the herbicide glyphosate, safe for use? And the answer, I think, is an unequivocal yes. But Enquête found his name in internal correspondence at Monsanto. As someone who is delivering the interpretations and messages we would like to have put forward on this subject, Dr. Ritter declined to answer our questions. Some federal scientists featured on the site were funded in the past by Monsanto, the maker of glyphosate. It's nothing unusual, says Mike Leger. Il y a beaucoup de scientifiques qui sont souvent leur recherche est souvent mentionnée par des compagnies. Euh, je crois pas que ça va créer un, un préjugé, un, un, un bias dans dans, euh, dans leur recherche. The site fails to mention this information to the public. Hey farmer, farmer, put away that glyphosate. But awareness around the controversy is starting to grow anyway. You know, there was terrible weather all over the province and, um, you know, there's still a huge crowd here. Um, it's pretty humbling. It's pretty, uh, pretty moving, really. We must stay vigilant until change occurs. Now, without the job he loved, Cumberland is relying on moments like this to remind him why he took up this fight. Sylvie Fournier, CBC News, Montreal. And still ahead, our moment takes us to a sleepy corner of the UK. Something very strange is going on there. And it's why this village is being described as the most honest place in Britain. But first. In case you missed it, conspiracy theorists are having a field day with this 121-year-old photograph snapped in Yukon. Now look closely and you'll see why. Doesn't this little one bear pretty uncanny resemblance to Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg? Or, as pockets of the internet have come to believe, maybe it's no coincidence. How eerie is it that they both wear their hair the same way, a side plate worn on the same side? New fave conspiracy theory, Greta Thunberg is a time traveler. That has to be photoshopped, surely. <laughs> nope. Not photoshopped. It's actually been in the University of Washington's archives for 50 years. This is a photo from the collection of a photographer by the name of Eric Haig, who was also Swedish, curiously enough. But like so many, he um, got the, the gold uh, fever and so went up to Skagway and to Chilkoot Pass and started photography, photographing um, miners and prospectors on their way up to the Yukon. There's no word yet on whether Greta herself has seen her doppelganger, but Fridays for Future, a climate activist group, says while the girl really looks like Greta, it's important to listen to science and there's no evidence time travelers exist yet. Welcome back to our Vancouver newsroom. New York's former mayor, Michael Bloomberg, has moved another step closer to a presidential run. Today, the billionaire filed paperwork to run as a Democrat in 2020, but it is not a done deal. A Bloomberg aide said a final decision hasn't been made. The 77-year-old has filed the paperwork in several states to keep his options open. Authorities in the Democratic Republic of Congo say nearly 5,000 people have died from an outbreak of measles. That's more than twice the number who have died of Ebola there in the last 15 months. Some 250,000 people are thought to be infected. The World Health Organization, which has been running an emergency vaccination program, calls the measles outbreak the largest and fastest moving epidemic 
in the world. Coldplay's latest album comes out tomorrow. Now, usually that's when a band heads out on a concert tour, but not this time. And guess why? We're taking time over the next year or two to work out how can not only our tour be sustainable, but how can it be actively beneficial? So I think Frontman Chris Martin speaking to the BBC in Jordan, where the band is set to play two shows tomorrow. He says they're taking time off from touring to make their gigs greener. That includes getting rid of single-use plastics and relying on solar power. We're back in two minutes with an update on some former Russian prisoners. Nearly two weeks after the last orcas were released from their so-called whale jail, how they're doing back in the wild. Well, it seems good news stories are hard to come by these days, but this one is a beauty. It's about dozens of whales you may have first heard about last year. They were discovered crammed into tiny sea pens, nearly a hundred of them in a remote area of Russia's far east. But their lives have changed dramatically since then. Chris Brown brings us this amazing update. Russia's prisoner whales are now free after the largest and most complicated whale release operation ever attempted. A total of 10 orcas and 87 belugas were all captured illegally and held for a year in watery cells that became known as Russia's whale jail, destined for aquariums in China. But a crush of domestic and international pressure pushed Russia's government to intervene. The releases began in the summer with the last whale swimming free earlier in November. And today, officials said remarkably, they believe all are still alive. So it was a real victory of uh, science and uh, the victory of uh, ecological uh, movement. The biggest challenge was getting the whales back to where they were caught, almost 2,000 kilometers away. So with military-like precision, fisheries officials first loaded the orcas onto trucks for a bumpy journey overland before transferring them into containers on a river barge for a six-day journey north and finally releasing them near where they could find food and maybe other family members. Scientist Vashislav Bizakov says they know one whale nicknamed Zoya that had a satellite tracker joined up with other wild orcas and eating hasn't been a problem. Unusually, Russia brought in foreign experts as advisors and even asked arch critics such as Greenpeace to monitor releases. And while this environmentalist says their advice wasn't always taken, he's pleased nonetheless with how things turned out. Wild animals, when they came back to nature, they can survive without help of people. The plan is to track some whales by satellite and if possible others visually to monitor their progress. But this encounter gives the scientists hope. Just a week after its release, a whale nicknamed Alexandra approached some fishermen who tried to feed her a fish and she wasn't interested. A good sign that they don't need food from people anymore. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Coming up, we head across the pond to a British village at the center of a mystery. Wait till you hear what's been turning up in these streets for years. Our moment is next. Well, in a small village in northern England, a mystery has been puzzling people for the last five years. Every once in a while, bundles of cash turn up around town. Just this week, Another one turned up, a big wad of 20-pound notes worth about $3,400 Canadian. But not only are these things turning up, police are a bit surprised that people keep turning them in 13 times now. And so this ongoing mystery and a town's honesty is tonight's moment. I think it's a modern-day Robin Hood, just generosity to the community. You'd have to imagine the potential is that there's other money being found that hasn't been handed into us. You know, we might never know the amount of that. But I'm still just thinking how great it is that, as I say, in a village, maybe 5,000 people live in this village, to have so many honest people, you know, their first instinct is to get straight to the police station. And I say, some of them are shaking when they come in. They just want that money to go straight back to the person who may have, may have lost it. It's a testament to people around here, though, that there's so many honest people living here, isn't it? And you haven't found any yet? No. <laughs> 
No, definitely not. <laughs> You know, Ian, I, I gotta say, I, and I'll be honest here, I don't actually know how I feel about this story because, I mean, there's a part of me that wants to think, okay, hey, maybe, maybe it's, it's just Christmas in this town all the time. They just find money uh, because that's what happens there. But, but there's another part, maybe, maybe this money comes from something else, right? Maybe, I don't know, proceeds of crime. Uh, I don't know, police are, are testing the money for fingerprints. They're trying to figure it out, but no answers yet. So what's your gut feeling? Uh, <laughs> see, see I, I think... No, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to speculate. I, I hope it's something good. <laughs> and I would like to think that it's a super rich person who's decided to just hand <laughs> yeah. these out. And 13 have been uh, returned. Who knows how many weren't returned. By the way, I think in Canada, this is not a legal opinion, but I think in Canada, if you find money like that uh, and it's unclaimed, you're allowed to keep it. Mm. Interesting. I didn't <laughs> know that. Uh, that's National for this Thursday, November 21st. Have a good night. Good night.